Good morning, Pump. How are you? Doing great. We have a lot to go over in markets this week. The Russell 2000 is up 12% this year, and something like 90% of those gains have come in the last week. Tell us what you're seeing in this small cap and big tech disparity. Yeah, so if you look at the beginning of this year, everyone was super long in uh, kind of big tech, you know, NASDAQ 100, MAG7, et cetera. And really what they were looking for is, how do I get exposure to this AI trend? How do I get exposure to what many would consider some of the best businesses that have ever been created in the world, right? The operating leverage that these businesses have, the efficiency of capital, uh, their ability to grow revenue, their ability to launch new products with the distribution that they have. There's tons of compounding effects that obviously drive financial performance. That financial performance is not only exciting today, but the promise of AI, the promise of what they're doing, people forward look and they say, hey, these businesses are only going to be even more valuable in the future. I'm willing to pay more today. And so that financial performance of these businesses is incredible. If you look at the tech sector uh, of the S&P, it is compounded over the last five years annualized at 25.9%. That is incredible performance for large cap, you know, publicly traded stocks. And so uh, I think people got very excited about that. You know, there were some people who were long going into the year, others started to get convinced, they began to go long, et cetera. Now, what's interesting is we have seen the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow, et cetera, all hitting all these all-time highs. Interest rates are still five and a half percent, you know, uh, et cetera. And so when people see the inflation number, say, oh, wait a second, this isn't as hot as it was, they begin to play the game of what if. And the game of what if says, well, if inflation is not as hot, then what is next? Well, then the Fed will cut rates. If the Fed cuts rates, that means that debt is cheaper. If debt is cheaper, the smaller companies, which use lots of debt on a percentage basis compared to the big companies, will have cheaper capital, which means that then they will be able to borrow more, which means that they will be able to invest more, grow their businesses faster, et cetera. And so you're seeing this rotation basically from, hey, when interest rates are high, I actually want to be in companies where they don't use a lot of debt. And the big tech companies have been doing that, plus all the AI, et cetera. Uh, and then now if capital is going to get cheaper, I want to then get exposed to these smaller companies who will then go use that cheaper debt. And so, um, you know, in hindsight, it's obvious. I think that the key part to this was um, people have been predicting slower, less hot inflation for a while, uh, and it hasn't actually come to fruition. And so it's been hard to kind of time that market. Um, but you know, guess who did? Stanley Druckenmiller, once again, 13F just came out. His biggest position basically was Russell 2000 options. Uh, and um, I think it was like 15% of uh, his portfolio. Um, and the guy just nailed it. <laughs> As usual, that's, the goat. <laughs> that's legendary. Um, so this rotation into small caps and out of big tech, that is a lot to do with the Fed cuts coming. How much of that do you see as part of the Trump trade that people are throwing around? It's in all the financial press right now. Yeah, the Trump trade stuff is hilarious to me, right? Because I think that there are uh, two things. One, um, there's just the excitement. Like we're in kind of the the sideways summer. It's really boring. People are looking for something to be excited about. Here comes, you know, President Donald Trump's odds are skyrocketing that he's going to be the president. People go and say, let's look in the rearview mirror at 2016. What happened? There was deregulation. There was devaluing of the dollar. There was interest rates at zero. Like all these things that occurred oh, if Trump gets in office, we're gonna go right back to that. And um, so that excitement is actually speculation, right? Uh, at the same time, he is talking about some of his policies and there is a lot of deregulation. It does appear that some of the policies would be kind of weaker dollar, higher inflation, you know, um, et cetera. And so uh, how do you position yourself? Well, if the odds are increasing, that means that you should be also increasing the odds that you're positioned to benefit from that situation. Um, now, the interest rate cuts specifically, I don't think are as much part of kind of the overall Trump trade. Um, you know, Trump and Biden both have interfered quite often with the Federal Reserve in a soft power way. So neither one of them walks into the Federal Reserve and says, hey, Jerome Powell, you're going to do this. But they sure try to influence it via soft power, right? So uh, Trump, his method of influence was Twitter. He would just get on Twitter and start tweeting yeah. about, you know, weakening the dollar and, and all these kind of different things. Um, Biden would be more kind of politically correct in that um, on multiple occasions, he called Jerome Powell to his office when things weren't going so hot and basically was like kind of calling the teacher to the principal's office saying like, hey, what's going on? Um, and so this is not a partisan thing, if you're the president of the United States, a huge part of how you are judged is based on the economy. And one of the biggest inputs into the economy is what is the cost of capital? And so naturally you want to influence in either direction what you think should happen, although you don't have control. And so um, 
Trump now is out in the public saying, hey, they shouldn't cut interest rates before the election. That would be election interference. That would be, you know, all these different things. On the same side, you know, Jerome Powell had some comments where he's like, well, listen, if we wait till inflation is at 2%, we waited too long. And so there's this very interesting dynamic. And if you go and you look in the market, you know, depending on what data point you look at, whether it's a prediction market, the the you know bond yields, et cetera, it's like 80 to 90% likelihood that by September, we are going to have an interest rate cut. That happens to be months before an election. And so it's just a very kind of interesting uh, aspect. But the Trump trade, I think, is more like policy driven of the deregulation, et cetera. The interest rates are probably more a reflection of like what's going on in the economy, although the president or the president, you know, uh, to be or want to be or whatever uh, wants to influence that stuff. But I'd love to hear kind of like, what do you think is going to happen? So there's a big deregulation play, I think. And, um, you know, part of that, the small caps will benefit. And uh, I know financials are doing quite well. And I've talked to a lot of strategists who are anticipating a lot of more, a lot more better um, performance from financials. Um, but a big piece of this, of course, is is the crypto uh, crypto play and Bitcoin and ETH, I think, are both up maybe 10 percent in the last week. Um, and a lot of that is from Trump. He's pro crypto. His new VP, uh, J.D. Vance, very pro crypto. Um, what's your take on how like what's the crypto outlook now that Trump's odds are going up and he's picked J.D. Vance? Today's episode is brought to you by Domain Money. I get asked all the time, Pomp, where should I go for financial advice? Now, as you all know, I can't personally give financial advice, but I now know people who can. Domain Money makes financial planning straightforward and accessible. They tailor plans to your personal priorities and goals, whether you want to buy a big house, whether you want to fund college, or you want to take that dream vacation. Now, I'm not a Domain Money client, and they are paying me for this ad, as you know. And I've seen firsthand, though, the value of their service through a free plan they did for one of my brothers. Him and I got on with one of their financial advisors and they walked us through the whole process. It was awesome. Domain Money offers unbiased, flat fee advice with no minimums and zero misaligned incentives. They're not managing your assets or selling you products. It's pure, practical, and tactical financial guidance. Need more advice? They also pay by the hour options for plan updates or coaching sessions. Don't be like most people who have never had a real conversation about their financial plan. Trust Domain Money to help you build a clear roadmap for your future. It's hands down the smartest move you can make for your money. Book a free strategy session with Domain Money at DomainMoney.com slash POMP. Again, DomainMoney.com slash POMP. And yes, I might have an interest in promoting domain. So just like any major financial decision, it's important you understand what the service is and if it's right for you. So make sure to see the important disclaimer at dmnmny.co slash x. How about that? Go check it out today. Go to domainmoney.com slash pomp. I have a harder time believing that Bitcoin's price is going up because Trump's odds are going up as president. Yes, he is sympathetic to crypto uh, and Bitcoin. He has said, hey, I'm a pro crypto candidate. I will protect this. Uh, I think he's even gone as far as to say he wants every Bitcoin to be made in America. Yeah. Uh, great tagline. Not exactly how the network works, but but at least, uh, uh, you know, the, the sentiment, I think, is very well received by the American population. Um, I actually think that Bitcoin's price has been going up because somebody tried to assassinate the president. Right. And this idea that like that is a potentially destabilizing event is a very chaotic, uncertain, um, you know, kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, ever changing situation that now people say, like, wait a second, there's political violence going on. And you've seen this in other countries. And that's really where I get the data point from. You've seen places where uh, there has been some sort of conflict. There has been some sort of political violence. There has been some sort of controversy, chaos, uncertainty, et cetera. And in those countries, you see more buying of Bitcoin. And so if you go back and you look on Saturday night, uh, the night that um, somebody shot uh, Donald Trump, you can see that on the news of the president, uh, the former president has been shot, the price actually drops. It immediately, I mean, it's like the news hits, you know, the wire and gets on Twitter, the price drops. And then as soon as everyone realizes he's okay, the price just 180s and rips higher. And so to me, what that is signaling is the price dropped because there was a moment of panic and fear and like, did the former president just get assassinated, right? Did he just get killed on live television? The second that people realized uh, it didn't actually work, it wasn't successful, 
the price goes up because people realize like we're in a new era now. Right, like we are, we haven't had an assassination attempt on the president in terms of like actually physically hurting the president uh, or former president in decades. And so when that occurred, people started to say, oh, this is possible, right? There's an uncertainty to this. And so that to me is the catalyst of why Bitcoin has been going up. Now, to your point, it doesn't hurt the fact that Trump's odds are going up. He tends to be a pro Bitcoin, pro crypto candidate. Um, and so that might be like the continuation of the trend, but there's a very real measurable inflection point Saturday night on the assassination attempt where Bitcoin was reacting to the news. And notably, the stock market was closed. And so in real time, the only way that you could really express your views of the world and the future in financial markets, almost every market in the world was closed except for Bitcoin and crypto. So I, I think Mark Cuban tweeted something that the Bitcoin going up and the support that Trump is getting now from a lot of the tech billionaires, that is them voting for Bitcoin. Do you see that as, I mean, is that part of your, your analysis here? Yeah, I, I read what, uh, what Mark said. Um, I think Mark's incredibly intelligent. And I think that, you know, the through line that he's pulling on uh, is very interesting. Um, in my experience, uh, there's kind of two different camps of the tech, you know, kind of billionaire crowd. Um, some of them actually own Bitcoin, but hate the Bitcoin holders because there's like an envy of I worked really hard, I built these companies, I like made all these, you know, took all this risk. That person just bought Bitcoin and like forgot about it for a decade, right? And now all of a sudden they've got a bunch of money, right? Type thing. Uh, so I do think that there's like, it's not as clear like, hey, just because I own Bitcoin, like I think all Bitcoiners are, you know, cool and smart and, and, and that. Um, that is a subset, kind of a, a minority subset, but there's definitely people I've met where you can just feel the like disdain as to like how somebody just bought the asset, held it, and they made money. Um, the other part of the crowd, uh, I actually don't think a lot of the support is specifically tied to their wallets, whether it is um, their businesses, Bitcoin, etc. That definitely has a piece of it. It definitely plays into it. Um, but but I think that you know. One of the components that becomes really interesting when you talk to these people, uh, when you reach a certain level of wealth, there's not really another amount of money that matters. Like if Elon Musk makes $10 billion more, his life doesn't change, right? So like he is not going to go out and support a political candidate because he thinks that it's going to be good for some financial asset. Now, he may support a candidate that is going to be good for his business in terms of something he controls and runs, right? Bitcoin is just a financial asset that he would own, but Tesla is a business that his reputation is tied to, he's working on, et cetera. What is interesting is Trump actually is not that big of a fan of EVs, right? So in a weird way, Musk is supporting somebody who has been attacking his industry and his, his companies. Now, Musk is very, uh, or I'm sorry, Trump is very supportive, I think, of SpaceX and some of the other things that he's doing. Obviously, uh, Twitter, he's got a, a weird relationship with where he was a power user, but now he's got true social. So like that relationship between, you know, one of the richest men in the world and the political candidate that now he is supporting is not as clear that like it is good for Musk's wallet if Trump gets into office. And so if you bring it back to the Bitcoin thing, um, there's a lot of people who are coming out who I don't think own Bitcoin. Also, right in a weird way. And so what I really think that they're basically saying to themselves is uh, I want somebody who is going to support the acceleration, you know, kind of the, the accelerate movement, if you will. Um, and it feels like whether it's true or not, I actually think kind of the vibe, right, if you use that as the, the proxy is almost more important than the facts here. It feels like one political party is degrowth, slow down stop you know the pipelines stop all of the the innovation be careful over regulate overreach you know etc and the other political party is saying the opposite and so when you get that kind of bifurcation again whether it's true or not just that the thought that that's the narrative obviously the business people are going to gravitate towards that and uh somebody called me recently and they were like you know kind of what's, what's your take on this um and I think just kind of saying what I said in private is probably the best way to describe this. I said, oh, shocker, the business people want a business person in office, yeah. right? <laughs> like, like that shouldn't surprise anybody, regardless of these political parties. And so what you really have in a weird way is you have a career politician versus a career businessman. And so like, if you just look at it on the basics of that, take it a step further, one political party is trying to take things from you the other political party is trying to give things to you. 
And again, that's like almost oversimplified. But what do you think the business people are going to vote for, right? Is they're going to vote for the people who don't want to take things from them and wants to give them things. And so you can actually debate. And, and I would say a big part of that conversation is, is that good long term what they're giving you? If they give you a weaker dollar, if they give you less regulation, if they give you all this stuff over the long run, it's unknown, right? Like, like there are some aspects of deregulation that are fantastic. And, you know, I think we would all run and scream and say, like, let's deregulate this. There's other aspects of, well, maybe actually we shouldn't deregulate 100% of everything. Uh, a weaker dollar has some amazing benefits in the short to medium term. But the long-term benefits of a weaker dollar may not be as clear as the short to medium term. And so I think, you know, everyone wants to make this stuff black and white, but we can just kind of walk around, you know, look at this and you're like, why are they supporting Trump? And then the more nuanced, the more like, you know, you're like, oh, they're looking around the corner. It's just kind of like, you know, a lot of conspiracy theories around the government, like you're giving the government too much credit. I think a lot of times it's like, hey, these people are, um, they're on Twitter. Some of these individuals who are supporting Trump are on their like fifth or sixth endorsement for this campaign, right? Or this election cycle. And they just want to be on the winning side, right? Like at the end of the day, they just want to say, in July of 2024, I endorsed X person and they became president. Look how smart I am. It doesn't matter. Everyone forgets about the first four or five endorsements that you made, <laughs> right? They just like, you get a claim victory because uh, in July you said, I'm going to back Trump and Trump wins. So what do you think are some of the economic downsides of a Trump presidency? Because there's a lot of talk that some of his deregulation moves that he wants could be inflationary. Today's episode is brought to you by CrossFi. CrossFi is the Apple Pay for crypto. For the first time in history, anyone with a Web3 wallet like MetaMask can spend crypto through a physical or virtual Visa card anywhere in the world where Visa is accepted. No more exchanges or middlemen. Just link your wallet, get your card, and start spending today. CrossFi card transactions have already been successfully processed in New York, Los Angeles, London, Dubai, China, Japan, and over 20 other countries. Be one of the first to get your hands on a CrossFi by card and a prize pool of up to three million dollars by joining and participating in their test net today you can go to xfi.foundation slash users again that's xfi.foundation slash users go check it out today yeah um so from my perspective looking at the two uh kind of options on the table from a purely economic standpoint forget all of the other topics that are you know part of uh, evaluating a president etc from a pure economic standpoint donald trump would be much better than joe biden right um now when you look at that what are the downsides you have to understand the policies right so deregulation weaker dollar um and uh uh kind of an understanding of crypto and ai etc with picking jd vance uh, as vice president and some of the people he surround himself with if you look at, let's say, weaker dollar, right? It can be inflationary. It doesn't have to be, but it definitely can be. On top of that, if you look at things like um, Trump recently came out and said he wants to change the corporate tax rate from 21% down to 15%. Sounds awesome. There's something called the Laffer, uh, Laffer curve, right? And Art Laffer came up with this idea that if you actually lower the corporate tax rate, that will encourage job growth, R&D, innovation, growth, etc. which means that even though each corporation is paying a lower percent, the overall aggregate amount of taxes collected will go up. Now, heavily debated. I tweeted about this, people from all sides, everyone comes out, right? Everyone's got an opinion. There are examples, Europe being one example, uh, where this has actually worked. There are many other examples where it has not worked. And so it's kind of this weird thing of like, it's not just the theory, it's how is it implemented, right? And, and it's really important. And so that's a perfect example where if you lower the corporate tax rate, given that we've got a $35 trillion deficit and, or a, a national debt, and we've got a you know trillion and a half to $2 trillion annual deficit, and you don't collect more tax uh, receipts, that's a problem, right? You're actually widening the deficit. Now, if it works and you lower the corporate tax rate, you keep capital in the hand of good capital allocators, business people, and you take it out of the hands of the bad capital allocators in the government, and that leads to more tax revenue, you actually could close the annual deficit. So. Lowering the corporate tax rate is not good or bad. It is only in hindsight can you evaluate based on the execution, did you actually get more tax revenue or not, right? So if you're gonna lower the tax rate and you're not gonna get more tax revenue, then you probably didn't actually accomplish the goal of by lowering the tax rate, driving job growth, innovation, you know, et cetera. 
And so again, we start getting into the weeds of some of these topics and the answer that people don't like is like, well, it depends. And there's so much nuance there. Um, and it brings the question like, do the politicians actually understand this stuff in great detail? I actually think the economic stuff, uh, Trump and his team seem to be pretty strong on, right? It helps that they've been operating this. A real estate investor and a developer has to understand interest rates, has to understand, you know, kind of the dollar strength or weakness. Um, but for every one topic that they understand, there's another topic that, you know, somebody would be yelling and screaming, China tariffs, right? And yes. people would be yelling and screaming and saying, hey, well, how are you so good at this one policy and this other one, you know, seems insane. So speaking of people he's surrounding himself with, um, there are these reports coming out that he's looking at Jamie Dimon for Treasury Secretary. And um, Jamie Dimon is famously anti-crypto, anti-Bitcoin. But now Trump is saying, oh, Jamie Dimon's changing his view on that. Give us your take on that. First, everyone in the Bitcoin world loves to hate on Jamie Dimon. It's easy, right? It's kind of like uh, Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates used to be the you know startup pirate in the garage who's going to take on the man, and then he became the man. And now people are like, you know, why are you releasing uh, genetically engineered mosquitoes into the uh, air? And you know, why are you you know trying to get uh, uh, engineered food and like all the stuff? And like, oh, big bad evil billionaire, right? So like, live long enough and you become the man. Jamie Dimon uh, is definitely the man. The reason why he is the man or the target for the Bitcoin world is one, he has been critical publicly about Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency, but two is he represents the epitome of the banking system. He is the most well-respected banker of our generation, right? He is an incredible leader. He is an incredible financier, and he has been an incredible executive at growing JP Morgan into what it has become today. So if you look at it from the finance perspective and you were evaluating him, he gets an A plus report card being the CEO of JP Morgan. But if you are the competitor of Bitcoin to some degree, right? The kind of, we want to put a bank in everyone's pocket without the banks. Yeah, you don't like him, right? You're like, yeah. hey, that's a star player on the other team. Like we actually don't like him. Um, but the beauty of Bitcoin is that Bitcoin seems to have the facts on its side, right? Kind of the truth is on its side. Um, and what I mean by that is there's hundreds of millions of people around the world that hold it and use it. There are, uh, Bitcoin is the strongest computer network in, ever created in the world. You also now have governments around the world becoming much more sympathetic and positive towards the legal and regulatory treatment. Um, and then also Bitcoin is the only asset I'm aware of that has consistently protected your purchasing power over the last decade with this accelerated inflation. And so when you look at it from that perspective, you say to yourself, okay, of the store of value assets, this is probably one of the most popular, definitely probably one of the most resilient. It's now got the same legal treatment and regulatory treatment as other commodities and store values. And it has done a better job of protecting my purchasing power than anything else. Well, if you're in the finance game, like you gotta pay attention, right? So like the facts have changed now and it's become much more obvious. And so the last thing I'll say is, um, Jamie Dimon's not dumb. Right. Like this guy's incredibly intelligent. And so, sure, would he probably in hindsight go back 10 years and be like, oh, I wish that I would have bought Bitcoin and, you know, uh, understood this and got the bank and whatever. Sure. But it's not actually where you start. It's all about when you are presented with new facts, do you change your mind? Like That is the sign of intelligence. Um, and so Jamie Dimon's path is no different than Trump's. Go back. Trump was railing on Bitcoin, too. Everyone has amnesia. We, we forgot about that because now he's coming to speak at the Bitcoin conference, right? Like, yeah. you know, shows up at the Bitcoin conference. He's going to say, Orange Coin is good. I'm the Bitcoin president. And people will literally forget all the other stuff he said. Jamie Dimon comes out tomorrow and says, Orange Coin is good. Number go up. I'm going to be the Bitcoin banker. Like, let's roll. Literally, you ain't going to hear anybody complaining about Jamie Dimon anymore, <laughs> right? And why do I know that? Because that's what they did with Larry Fink. Larry Fink is the CMO of Bitcoin. He has been accepted with wide open arms. People are saying, Larry, thank you. You are amazing. Keep going on TV saying it's a, you know, a flight to quality, all these things. Larry Fink was not a Bitcoiner five years ago, right? He changed his mind. And so I do think that maybe a word of caution to the Bitcoin community, when people disagree with the Bitcoin story, the Bitcoin facts, um, it's okay to push back, right? Like part of the debate is try to educate them and, and convince them, but don't kick people while they're down because they may actually change their mind. And if they change their mind, we have a history now of accepting these people kind of on our team. And so uh, when they do that, don't dunk on them and say, oh, you know, I bought before you and said, say, hey, thank you so much. Like who else can you now help us go do it? Because one of the big stories I think in Bitcoin is uh, the messenger matters now more than the message. Larry Fink is more important than anything any Bitcoiner is gonna say. 
Jamie Dimon will be even more important. And if the president of the United States is running around doing press conferences, talking about Bitcoin is good, the world will change in a crazy, crazy way. On that note, uh, Palm, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for doing this.